very cool. Mm -hmm. It's so fucking good. Really good. See, it's dark. Oh, here we go. There we go. There we are. Nice. A little slow. Are we ready? Yeah. Looks like it's a little slow. Let me pop it up. Let me check it okay. out. See what it looks like on my phone. Sounds good. If it's a little slow, that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, let me go to our... All right, let's check it out. All right. Yeah, it looks good. It looks good. All right. All right. Let's go. Uh, welcome, everyone. Today is a teaching demonstration. Uh, so enjoy listening to it and share your thoughts and feedbacks. The title of this demonstration is A Sisterhood Forged in Science, Comparing the Lives of Amy Lyman Brown and Clara Mohammed. So as you might have known uh, recently there has been a Supreme Court case uh, about abortion and it's received a lot of traction on social media. If you follow a legal study uh, or uh, approach it from a legal perspective uh, you might trace it back to the Roe v. Wade case, uh, a Roe v. V, Roe v. Wade case in the late 1960s. Uh, but I want us to uh, think about the extent to which an exclusively legal framework ignores the everyday lived experiences of women's uh, uh, experiences of motherhood in particular and the ways in which the state regulates that experience. And so to understand that uh, interplay, uh, I would like to share a couple of stories, uh, one of Clara Mohammed, the other of Amy Lyman Brown. Both were contemporaries uh, navigating how to be a mother in the immediate aftermath of the Great Depression which was another seminal moment uh, when the power of the state to regulate sexuality was coming undone and the state had to figure out how to uh, reinforce its power. So the first slide, as you can see, uh, it contains a, a, a family uh, sitting in front of a front porch. Uh, Amy, uh, sorry, Clara Mohammed was one of those uh, uh, women as well who routinely spent time in front of the front porch she was faced by a social worker and a police officer who demanded that she send her children to the Detroit public school system. Uh, her warning, that these warnings came, uh, uh, there was a lot at stake for, uh, for Clara to uh, agree with and conform to the social workers and the police officer because in the immediate aftermath of the Great Depression, uh, women uh, on, these, uh, on the street uh, were dependent on receiving welfare money from social workers. And to ignore the command would entail uh, defying a public health mandate uh, to attend the Detroit public school system. Mm -hmm. Well, nevertheless, uh, Clara Mohammed says, on my dead body. Uh, she defies the orders. And to understand why she defies the order, it's important to pay attention to the ways in which migrant women experience motherhood in the city. So Clara is one of the many, many women who migrated from the rural south to Detroit uh, a large influx of uh, these folks coming into the city. By 1970, we know that about a thousand migrants were coming per month. And what had enticed them to enter Detroit was a promise by Henry Ford that he would pay uh, workers on his assembly line $5 an hour, which back then was a ton of money. And uh, he had assembled the assembly line quite like uh, a war zone. Uh, since World War I was happening, American soldiers, uh, Americans were moving uh, to fight war. There was a lot of the, uh, job openings uh, in Detroit. So very interestingly, the assembly line is very much kind of designed like a war field as well. Uh, what happens uh, for Amy is that uh, she uh, follows her husband, Elijah, to Detroit. By then, they have two young children. Uh, Elijah roams around and uh, perpetually uh, is f transferring from one job to another, uh, much lower paying job, never really finds uh, the, that prized assembly line work. Uh, Clara uh, is working as a domestic servant in the meanwhile because migrant women did not have access to jobs that were considered industrious. 
and were restricted to working in fields that were considered uh, feminine and uh, considered to be one that uh, was based on the virtue of nurturance. Well, what happens is that uh, the more Clara works as a domestic servant, spending most of her day in white households that were outside the Black Bottom neighborhood where she was living, uh, the greater scrutiny there is about her own capacity to raise children. Uh, we have social workers who make uh, case files, observations of the houses on, on, on Hastings Street, and they discovered that on Hastings Street, these homes uh, lacked delineation by sex. So where women were sleeping was also where the men were sleeping, also where the children were sleeping, and oftentimes you had other coming border, other boarders living uh, in these homes because there were not enough houses elsewhere, and people were living together and huddling around because not everybody had the ability to pay uh, rent separately. This becomes a key problem for social workers because it's assumed that this lack of sexual delineation is a cause for the spread of a disease. The questions about how to mitigate the spread of disease is happening in public school system. Because in public school system, the Detroit public school system, classes are segregated between the feeble-minded students and the strong-minded students. And this delineation is happening through educational practices like having students take this bidet, uh, Simon Bidet test, which is a forerunner of the IQ test. And the point here was that every student has the capacity to be strong-minded, but some do not uh, have that in them currently because they do not have the capacity to control their bodily urges. Their mind isn't strong enough to control the body. Now these assumptions about the mind as controlling the body and that being important for mitigating the spread of infectious diseases is happening. Uh, this, this, these ideas are being bolstered around uh, the, the bodies of migrant women because migrant women, in particular the mothers of these children, are the ones who are moving around the city and are raising suspicion about whether they know how to control their bodies or not. So historically speaking, the first group that was targeted for feeble-mindedness was prostitutes. But as, uh, as I already mentioned, migrant women, broadly speaking, would come under attack as well, particularly how they're designing the household. The fracture in the family was most acutely felt uh, in the domain of the food. Uh, because we don't, uh, let's see if we can move the images. So these are uh, children walking unsupervised, raising concerns whether the migrant women are actually looking after their children or not. Uh, and this is uh, Clara's uh, childhood, uh, spending time on a buggy uh, on a farm where she grew up in Cordell Ge County, Georgia, which shows you the differences between mother and children in a farm where she would help her mother irrigate the fields and milk the cows and spend the evening time riding a, a buggy. But in Detroit, she's not spending time with her children. So what happens in Detroit is that uh, Detroit is delineated around food. The neighborhood called Hastings Street, which is there is a map of the hit neighborhood, uh, you can see that uh, this neighborhood is located in the Lower East Side. To its immediate west is downtown Detroit. Right above it is Eastern Market, which is a public market where the rest of the city was fed. To its right is Elmwood Cemetery, and below is the Detroit River. So what happens initially in the, seven, in the 18th century is that Hastings Street uh, was not a neighborhood back then. Back then, Detroit was a complex web of streams and creeks, and the French who settled Detroit observed that there were all these muskrats and beavers that they could eat. These rivers and streams, uh, according to uh, Ponch Chartrain, which was one of the settlers, said it replenished his soul and his body because you could eat food and, and eat fruits uh, right in front of you, right next to the banks. But uh, later on, around 1827, uh, Detroit is, becomes an industrial city. It's on the uh, auspices of becoming one. And one of the decisions they make is install a water sewage system. The sewage system descends into the Detroit River right at the bottom pit of the Black Bottom neighborhood, thus the name The Bottom. So rather than uh, the scent of paradise and the, 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 the sounds of the creek, uh, the residents have to endure all kinds of smell and stench uh, coming emanating from the sewer. Alongside that, food becomes something that is consumed rather than right in front of you. So you go purchase food rather than hunt uh, and, and, and collect the food that's in, around you. Uh, the, the rest of the city goes to Eastern Market. The folks living in Hastings Street neighborhood go to these local grocery stores in, uh, on the streets, such as this one where you can see a sign of Coca-Cola 
around here, right beneath down here. Another one is this grocery store. Most of these grocery stores were, were owned by professional and entrepreneurial class of African Americans. The residents of the neighborhood were not those, they were working migrants, but they would purchase food from these, uh, uh, these grocery stores. Well, after the Great Depression, the, price, uh, the food prices hike, and uh, Clara, and alongside all these other migrant women, endure abject poverty. So one of the things Clara would do in the evening time is that she would put her own shoe inside the pot with the boiling water to give the illusion that she's cooking food just so that her kids felt like there was food impending even though she really had nothing to feed them. Uh, to make the matters worse, she is now dependent on social workers who give food um, and they have power because they're giving welfare money to these women. And the lowest moment that Nader in her, in her, in her life came about when uh, her own daughter, Lottie, uh, uh, requested a social worker to give her food and the social worker gave the food and Clara couldn't do anything about it because uh, Clara had nothing else to feed her. So there was this direct conflict where the social worker is usurping Clara's role as a mother. In the meanwhile, uh, a f friend of Clara uh, meets a guy named Farad who was selling silk on Hastings Street, uh, one of the main roads in the Black Bottom neighborhood. Farad was from Lahore, uh, back then part of a city, uh, a city in the British subcontinent. And Farad is uh, telling the women he meets selling silk uh, various insights about health and literacy based on this tradition called Islam. So this friend of Clara tells Clara that she should meet Farad. Clara decides to do so. And Farad gives this lecture in a union hall and Clara attends the lecture and then she tells her husband to go attend a lecture by Farad as well. Elijah goes, attends the lecture, he comes home and he takes away all the pork in the fridge and throws it into the trash can. Farad and Clara recognized, uh, uh, Elijah and Clara recognize that Farad has a message of food. How do you actually feed your family in a way that is sustainable and healthy? Uh, in particular, Farad introduces the recipe for the navy bean soup. And the story is very practical, very pragmatic story. He tells, uh, beseeches uh, uh, Clara, uh, actually orders, uh, or like kind of like tells Clara and her friend, you go around the city, look for a uh, pink bean um, to make the soup. And so they go around, they come back in the city, we have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we found some bean. The bad news, however, is that they're not navy, uh, they're not pink bean, they're navy bean. And Clara, uh, Farah says that would do, that's perfectly fine. So this navy bean soup, becomes a staple dish of a movement that would come about called the Nation of Islam. And before the movement spreads, Clara establishes a home school and integrates the Navy Bean into the curriculum, in particular the students uh, who are attending the home school, her own children and other children in the neighborhood, learn how to make the Navy Bean soup. And secondly, they memorize a bedtime story called English Lesson 1C, where the lesson is pretty simple. There are four or five sentences of a story which go as follow. Uh, our ancestors were Muslim. Uh, your uncle was a Muslim. Uh, he forgot he was a Muslim because he worked on a plantation where he was fed food that was foreign to him. And we are uh, uh, eating the navy bean soup to remember that we're Muslim now. And so this particular story uh, becomes part of this tradition. And this tradition was spread across other metropolitan cities that would endure similar problems that Detroit did. In particular, what happens with Detroit is that the public school graduates just add to the line of unemployed men because the Great Depression sustains for much longer than the city had expected. Uh, instead of racial harmony, which was the key idea behind strong-mindedness, creating these harmonious workers on the assembly line who were able to regulate their body and regulate their emotions, you have the race rights of 1943, so this neighborhood is engulfed in fire, and a decade later, the neighborhood is completely effaced. So this image, aerial image from the exact same point, uh, very uh, much can raise your eyebrows to see the drastic shift where this is Hastings Street neighborhood before its effacement. You can see the homes, you can see people walking on the streets, and this is afterwards, a flat four-lane highway constructed all over the, the neighborhood. So the neighborhood is completely bulldozed. So while Clara is able to uh, usurp, uh, uh, reclaim her uh, uh, authority as a mother through reverting to Islam against social workers, Amy Lyman Brown does the exact opposite. She actually revives a Mormon tradition of motherhood by embracing social work. So this is Amy Brown Lyman doing social service training. Amy Brown Lyman uh, was the president of the Mormon Relief uh, Society and uh, her career is uh, ambiguous. There were a lot of success as well as failures. 
uh, her success was that she was able to successfully draw financial aid from the federal government in the form of the Edmund uh, Tucker Act, which gave money uh, to women on raising children and maternal duties. She was able to draw upon that money to fund the Mormon Relief Society. But then the failure is that just as she's drawing all this money, in the immediate aftermath of the Great Depression, the money is being funneled into uh, other kinds of tasks that the church authority deemed much more pressing, dealing in particular with helping the men in the community. So let's try to make sense of how Amy Lyman compares to Clara Muhammad. And to do so, we need to pay attention to the history of the Mormon Relief Society itself. The Mormon Relief Society is established in, 19, in, sorry, in 1842 in the city of Nauvoo, Illinois, and it consists of women coming from the surrounding areas of Illinois, Missouri, Ohio, Pennsylvania, as well as women from as far away as the UK. All of them are enchanted by a peculiar idea and experiment of sexual experiment that is introduced by Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith uh, is a fellow who was the son of an agrarian farmer in uh, Northwest New York. And he institutes what, what is called uh, the sealed marriages, plural marriages. And in particular, his idea is that men will enter into marital relationships with a lot of women. And by entering into marital relationship with these women, they are bringing down sp human spirits that live in the air into giving them a corporeal body. So there's a very interesting notion of the divine as a father and a mother who give birth to corporeal spirits. And these spirits attain a bodily, uh, the human body through marriage. Ultimately, what it allows you to do is it completely recalibrates sexuality from a side of disease to a side of health. In particular, we're talking about everlasting happiness and health. Uh, that can uh, overcome all sorts of illnesses ranging from everyday issues like loneliness to the most, the most uh, uh, existential issue called death and mortality. These concerns about death, about family, about separation are all becoming heightened due to the construction of the Erie Canal, which will allow goods to be transported from New York City to uh, places as far as uh, Ohio, which was back then a western frontier. With the circulation of good, you have the rise of new urban centers de developing dramatically. And as a consequence, people in the farm areas are moving to the cities. This raises all kinds of concerns about family, specifically about women leaving their households and moving into the city, which was considered a sexually decadent space. Mm -hmm. So you can see the ways in which this theology of sexuality that Joseph Smith introduces allows you to reaffirm sexuality as a site of health. He embraces sexuality and sexual intercourse and sexual desires as not immoral, but rather the source of morality, the source of, div of uh, the, the moment when you encounter the divine. By the turn of the 20th century, however, there are new ideas about sexuality. In particular, there is this emphasis on women and men both regulating their bodies and their bodily desires and maintaining a relationship within a monogamous marriage. So with this new idea about sexuality, that sexuality can potentially be bad and that a job of a person is to maintain, uh, uh, their, uh, uh, to police and regulate their body, uh, leads to new, uh, new changes in the Mormon tradition as well. In particular, now you have a heightened sense of childhood as separate from adulthood, but at the same time, the child is enacting roles that an adult is supposed to do as well. So particularly, children are now supposed to grow and mature into developing sexual bodies just so that they can be attracted to one another and not to a lot of different women or a lot of different men. So men are doing, boys are doing things like hiking and women are doing things like homemaking and the point is that they're both becoming sexually attractive to each other but just within the confines of a monogamous marriage. The idea is that everything is not going to be confined within the home. Alongside that, uh, you see a complete uh, decline in the Relief Society. So in particular, what happens is Relief Society historically used to be run independently uh, because what the sealed complex marriage that Joseph Smith introduced, what it allowed women to do is it allowed them to do things by themselves without having intimate relationships with their husband. They could be physically set apart and distant from their husbands and do things on the farm, raising ox, building houses, do all kinds of things to support the community. But by the turn of the 20th century, just as these new ideas about sexuality are making women more entwined with their husbands, 
both having separate duties around self-regulation and self-policing, you also have that kind of policing happening in the institutional uh, structure. So uh, the, in the Salt Lake City, which uh, where you have 19 wards, and each ward is it, it has a bishop, the, the church authorities order the bishops to uh, consolidate all the buildings and take over all the real estate that the Relief Society used to own. So whereas previously Relief Society used to be run independently, now they're running within the auspices of the bishop's building. So you can see the ways in which the Relief Society is also very much being shaped by this new emphasis on bureaucracy, on centralization. Their general board meeting meets at, at, in, in a square. And it raises profound questions about what is the Relief Society supposed to do? How can you remake or sustain those relationships of sisterhood while undergoing these radical transformations and how you operate? For Amy Brown, Lyman, the answer was actually preparing women to do social work. So she tells women that if you train as social workers, you can still be able to go into the households of poorer women and help them with maternal needs. This is an insight that she learns from actually spending time with Jane Adams, who was one of the most prominent uh, social workers and established at a place called the Hull House in Chicago. And Jane Adams' idea was to get the migrant, the children of migrant, uh, migrants in Chicago learn how to work in ways that is productive and meaningful because the assumption was that these children of migrants were becoming distant from their parents as a result of the working conditions. Amy borrows that insight about building relationship with migrant children around how do you build relationship with the poor uh, f uh, uh, families in Salt Lake City. And her, uh, her, her argument is social work. So you can see the ways there is a certain tension there between that kind of shelteredness that, uh, uh, that, that, that sexual ideas are being, uh, with the advancement of these new sexual ideas where women are supposed to be sheltered and children are sheltered uh, in preparation for their monogamous marriage down the road, to this uh, emphasis on social work as a way to actually reproduce those kinds of sisterhood, relationships of sisterhood that used to exist in the 19th century. So Amy's genius is that she is able to revive the tradition by embracing this new modern science of social work. But a key difference between the two of them is that whereas Amy embraces social work, Clara rejects social work. And uh, the questions I would leave uh, for the audience is as follows. You know, how do you see social work impacting uh, religion? And in largely, the larger question of how is science impacting religion? What do you learn about race by looking at the life histories of these two women? One uh, is an African-American migrant woman living in Detroit. The other is a Mormon woman living in Salt Lake City. Um, and lastly, what insights do we gain from these two stories uh, to understand the present day uh, life experiences of, of women, especially women who are in between the ages of 20s and early 40s uh, and are facing issues with fertility? Uh, how can we create d digital technologies that allow women to reclaim their right to motherhood, their right to reproduction, and how are digital technologies alternatively being used to actually regulate women's ability to experience motherhood and, uh, and to have the right to their children? So how long was that? I mean, we started yeah, around like let's, All right. Four. Well, let's see. I have to... All right. Well, I'll see you guys on tomorrow. All right. Cool oh, presentation. Minutes. Yeah. Right on. Cool. Pretty cool presentation. Uh, follow up tomorrow talking mm -hmm. about stuff. Thanks mm -hmm. for joining us. See you tomorrow. See you, team.